<laughs> okay. All right. So I think we're right here. Okay. So I think we're on page three. And we're going to go ahead and finish this up first of all. So what we're doing is we're doing limits of sequences. So first of all, before I do the limit of this sequence, I want to just kind of maybe write out some of the t a couple of the terms and just do that to begin with. When you're doing a limit of a sequence, you don't really have to do that. Uh, but just to start with, remember, typically n is going to start at 1. Okay, that's what, that's what it's going to be assumed to start at unless it's otherwise stated. So if n was 1, we would have, um, let's see, 3 to the 1 plus 1 plus 3 over 3 to the 1st. So that would be like, and I'll just do some of this in my head, that would be like 3 to the 2nd, which would be 9, plus 3 would be 12 over 3, so the first term is 4, okay? I'm just doing that, what I can do in my head. And then let's do the, just go out to the next term in the sequence and see what we get here. So if we go to n equals 2, we would have uh, 3 to the 2 plus 1 plus 3 over 3 to the 2nd, okay? And I'm going to do this again in my head. That would be 3 to the 3rd, so that's 27, plus 3 is 30, and then that is uh, 9, like that. You could reduce that by 3 if you wanted to, so that would be 10 thirds like that. So 10 thirds is about 3 and a third like that. So one thing you can see from the sequence, first of all, is it's decreasing, right? And if we're looking at whether this, the limit of this sequence exists or not, we're just seeing if it converges to some point, okay? So that's probably not enough to tell. I, I can at least tell that it looks like it's decreasing as, as time goes on. Okay, so what we're going to do, whenever we do a limit of a, of a sequence, we're going to actually do this. We're going to do the limit. This is the main stuff you want to write down here. As, as, as it goes to infinity, we're seeing what happens at infinity of 3 to the n plus 1 plus 3 over 3 to the n. So we need to work that limit out. And what you're really doing is you're just kind of treating that sequence like you would a function. Okay, like if it was a function like you're in Calc 1, how do you do a limit? Well, let's see. One thing that you probably want to do is you want to simplify this thing first of all and kind of see what's going on with this. Um, just think about what we could do. So if we we're going to simplify this, the way I would probably look at this is just break this up, split it up kind of like this into two parts. So let's try this approach like this. Let's do 3 to the n plus 1 over 3 to the n plus 3 over 3 to the n like that. And then let's kind of see if that'll help us figure out what the limit's going to go to then. Okay, well let me ask you this then. What do you do like with the exponents on that piece? You subtract, right? Okay, it's a fraction. The bases are the same. They're both 3. You do the same thing here, you subtract those exponents, and that exponent on that is understood to be 1. So we're going to simplify that out a little bit further if we need to. So what you would end up having uh, with this then is if you subtract the exponents, we're going to have limit n goes to infinity. And see what I'm going to do with this is I'm really doing n plus 1 minus n. So that just gives me on that 3 to the first like that. Okay. Now this next one, I'm going to leave it alone. I mean, you could, if you wanted to, if you have 3 to the 1st over 3 to the n, you could write that as 3 to the 1 minus n if you wanted to. Okay, to me there's no need to do that though. So now I'm pretty much ready to do my limit. Okay, and you can do this limit in your head. I wouldn't care if you just did it in your head now. But by doing the limit theorems that we've learned, we would be doing the limit of 3, okay, we can do a limit of a sum as the sum of the limits, and then we would do the limit of uh, 3 over 3 to the n as n goes to infinity like that. So I'll pause there, and mainly what I've done is done algebra and arithmetic, okay, does everybody follow along what I've done so far? Okay, all right, doesn't it feel good to be back in Calc 2 after a week off? <laughs> Okay, now let me ask you guys a couple of questions on this now. What is the value of that limit, the limit of 3? Three? 3, okay, how about this one? 0, okay. Now the reason it's 0 is because the denominator is getting infinitely big, right? You're doing 3 to the infinity. If you're doing 3 over 3 to the infinity, 
That just means 3 over infinity, that goes to 0. Anytime you have a constant number over infinity, it's going to go to 0. So what's the value of this whole limit then? 3, good. Okay, so that goes 3. 3 plus 0, that's equal to 3. Didn't have to use L'Hopital's rule. You could on this one. It's actually an infinity over infinity limit at the beginning. But to me, it's I would rather do it this way than do L'Hopital's rule on that. But you could. Okay, so the other thing I was going to show you, let's see, I think I had a, I did a graph. I don't remember if I put a graph. Did I put a graph on your handout? I probably left it off, didn't I? Okay, it doesn't matter. So um, I showed you how you can do this. You could put this in your graphing calculator and just use X instead of N. And what you'd end up having is you can pretty well tell that this function is going to converge at 3. It just basically has an asymptote of horizontal asymptote of 3 anyway. That's the idea. Okay? Does that make sense? Does that look fairly good to start with? Okay. All right. So uh, let's do this one now. because And you're going to end up using lots of different tricks that you would have done in Calc 1 when you're doing these limits also. So let's see what we got going on on this one then. Now this time... I'm not going to write the terms of the sequence out, but you can if you want to. So we're just going to start by doing the limit as n goes to infinity of square root of n squared plus 1 minus n like that. Okay, And then we'll kind of see what we have going on on this then. Now this one right here, if you, if you just analyze this, this is kind of the way I look at this. Let me get off my... Uh, chair here for a minute. This is the way I would think of this in my head. When you're at infinity, that one makes very little difference on that. Do you agree? This is like insignificant. What's that? N. Okay, what's N minus N? So I suspect that it's going to go to zero. You see what I mean? Because that really is insignificant, but that does, that's not really an analytic way of doing it. It's just kind of a uh, kind of more intuitive way to figure out what that limit is, but I think that's worth knowing. Uh, so what we're going to do is do this more analytically. Okay, so right now, if we plug that infinity in, we need to do some algebra to this. You guys have any idea what I might try to do on this? You've done this lots of times. Probably conjugate, right? Okay, it just kind of has that look that maybe a conjugate would come in handy. So let's go ahead and multiply this by the conjugate. So we have square root of n squared plus 1 plus n. And then we get do the same thing to the bottom. Okay, like that. Okay, let's do that and let's see what happens. Now, see, this is not a L'Hopital's rule problem, at least not yet, because it is not a 0 over 0 form or an infinity over infinity form. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is let's multiply this out. Now, by now, I'd hope that you can pretty well manage that in your head. So when you multiply by the conjugate, all you worry about is the first term and the last term. So what's the first term? n squared plus 1. The radical goes away. Last term, <coughs> minus n squared. Ah, that's kind of cool. Okay, and then the bottom is just going to be square root of n squared plus 1 plus n, like that. Okay, then the n's are going to end up crossing out like that. So let's write what we have. Now we have the limit. n goes to infinity. It looks like we have 1 over square root of n squared plus 1 plus n. Okay. Now what we can go ahead is just plug in the infinity. Okay. Can you guys now see that it goes to 0 pretty clearly? Yeah, because the, the denominator is infinitely big. You know. So if you just, and, and you do this in your head. You don't really have to write this on your paper, but really for all practical purposes, that's just like the square root of infinity squared. So really all that matters is this thing is just going to zero. Okay, once you see that you have a constant over an infinitely big number, then you know it goes to zero. That's the idea. Okay, so don't forget that constant over infinity is always going to go to zero. Okay, and then this is what I, I went ahead and put this one in the graphing calculator. Uh, Pretty clearly you can tell on this. So it's not a bad idea when you're doing some of these problems to look at some of these on the graphing calculator so you can visually see what's going on. Okay, does that look okay to everybody so far? Okay. Now I think what we'll probably begin to get into a little bit here is some of these things that have to do with L'Hopital's rule. 
and they can kind of get kind of interesting. If you if you were to look at this one, you know, just to start with, let's go ahead and let's just kind of think about what this would look like if n was going to infinity. And let's see what kind of form we have here. So what we would have is if we did this, we'd have like 1 plus 4 over infinity to the 3 times infinity. Okay, so what is, the va what is that going to be inside the parenthesis in your head? 1, right? 1 plus 0. That's going to be 1. Okay, 1 to the infinity. Okay, now that is one of our indeterminate forms that we use L'Hopital's rule for. Okay, so what you're going to have to do is work with L'Hopital's rule to figure out the limit of this sequence. Everybody with me on that okay? All right. Now, any time that you have one of these indeterminate forms that has an exponent in it, you want to approach this by working with logarithms. So what I'm going to have you do is start this off like this. Let's pick a variable, like say y or something, and we're going to do, uh, just set that equal to 1 plus 4 over n to the 3m, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a natural logarithm of both sides because that allows me to bring that 3n down to the bottom. We're going to try to get this. Anytime you have one of these forms like 1 to the infinity, you could have 0 to the infinity, it has an exponent in it. You want to work with logarithms, and you want to try to change it to a 0 over 0 form or an infinity over infinity form, ultimately, is the idea. So let's go ahead and do ln of both sides. And uh, oh, I don't want to do that. I want to do, <laughs> do this. So we're going to do ln of both sides. 1 plus 4 over n to the 3n like that. Then you can bring the 3n down. You could even skip this step I just wrote if you wanted to, because you should be able to do that in your head by now. Okay, so let's go ahead and get that taken care of like that then. Okay. Now, see, what we're going to do is we're going to work with the limit of that right-hand side now, okay, because we've kind of changed that to an ln form. So what we're going to go ahead and do now is I'm just going to bring this down as ln y, and then we're going to go ahead and do the limit as n goes to infinity of 3n times ln of 1 plus 4 over n like that, okay? Now, let's think about what we got going on here. Let's think about, uh, this is the situation that you got to be kind of careful about. There's a couple things we could do. What could you do with that 3? This is a limit, after all. You can bring it out. Okay. Now, right now, this is not a L'Hopital's real form. It needs to be 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. So if you look at this right here, just bringing the 3 out, you would have an infinity there, and then that would be ln of 1 plus 0. So what's ln of 1? Zero, zero. zero. So you would have infinity times 0. Okay. We can't do L'Hopital's rule until we turn it into 0 over 0 over infinity over infinity. So the whole trick on this is to do something with that n. What I'm going to do is bring it down to the denominator, but write it as 1 over n. That's a trick. That's something you usually do in Calc 1 a little bit, too. So what I'm going to have you do is write this like this, then. Now, this is a trick that you get used to doing. Uh, just bring the 3 out, and then we're going to have that times the limit as n goes to infinity. And then I'm going to write this as ln 1 plus 4 over n all over 1 over n. So tell me if you guys understand what I just did. What happens if you divide by 1 over n anyway? You multiply by n, right? Okay. I didn't change the problem. The reason I did this is because now if you look at this, if you look at this numerator, so you've got ln of 1 plus 4 over infinity all over 1 over infinity. Can you guys see that's 0 over 0 now? Okay. All right, because what you have is ln of 1 over 1 over infinity, so that is 0 over 0. Okay. So that means I can lopy tall it now. Okay. All right. So, one of the things I'm going to do on some of these problems, just to save a little bit of time, I'm not going to do the, show the, the work on the derivative on this, just because you'd be able to do this. I have total faith that you would be able to do this okay. I think I'm right. 
Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and now I'm going to do L'Hopital's Rule. I just put a little LH to remind myself I'm doing L'Hopital's Rule, okay? And I'm going to go ahead and write out what these uh, things are, okay? So what we would have with this then is if you're doing this derivative right here, I'll just do this kind of at the side. If you did the derivative with respect to n of ln of 1 plus 4 over n, stuff like this, I'd just do this like on scratch paper or something. Now I'm going to write that as 4n to the negative 1. Okay, that would be 1 over this function like that, okay, because you're doing a derivative of a natural logarithm, so it's 1 over the function. Then it's the derivative of the function, okay, which would be the derivative of that inside part by the chain rule, which would be negative 4n to the negative 2. So that looks like that's going to be negative 4 over n to the second, 1 plus 4n to the negative 1 like that. And then I'm going to multiply that out and kind of see where that takes me uh, then, okay, when I do that, okay? So let's see, if I multiply this out, that's going to be negative 4 over n to the second, plus, and then that's going to be 4 in like that, and then you can write the derivative that way. I'm actually just going to factor out that in like that. So that's going to be n plus 4, okay? So I'm going to take this thing and replace it with what that derivative is, okay? So that derivative is going to be negative 4 over n times n plus 4 like that, and then that leaves us with doing the derivative of 1 over n, so if you do the derivative of 1 over n, I'm just going to write that as n to the negative 1. That's going to be negative 1 n to the negative 2. So that's negative 1 over n squared. Okay, like that. All right, everybody follow those derivatives okay? You should be okay with that. I just usually stuff like that, I just do it with scratch paper or something like that. So what I've done is I've done L'Hopital's rule. And the idea that I want to do from here is probably simplify this mess right here, then see if the then do the limit as n goes to infinity and see where we're at. Now one of the things I'm gonna do, I'm gonna erase this derivative. You guys don't have to write that derivative step down. It, it that's pretty that should be pretty elementary. I know I'm gonna erase that just so I have room and you don't need to worry about that, I don't think. Okay, so this is mainly what I want to have you down have down is this stuff right there. Okay? Now, so what I'm going to do is we're going to go ahead and simplify this a little bit. And don't forget to bring that ln y down because that's an important part of the problem. So we're going to have 3 times the limit. And if you simplify this, some of this stuff I, I'm just going to do, um, I'm not going to show all the steps on this because if you simplify this, I mean, if you just went through and divided that, you multiply by the reciprocal, that's what you would end up getting. The negatives would cross out, and then one of the ends would cross out like that. That's what you would get. Okay, I'm not going to go through the details of that, though. Okay, so let's see kind of where we're at now with this and see what we have. Now, let me ask you if you know this or not. You may know this. I, don't, I hope you do. Okay, let's see. Even after spring break, I hope you know this. Do you guys know what that limit is just like that? Four. How come? Yeah, it's kind of like a, it's like a horizontal asymptote, right? So the degree of the top is the same as the degree of the bottom. So see, your horizontal asymptote is 4 over 1. So you can go ahead and do that now, or you can do L'Hopital's rule again, because isn't this an infinity over infinity form now? Okay, it's infinity over infinity, so if you want to do L'Hopital's rule again, you're more than welcome to do that, okay? So... Uh, yeah, let's do L'Hopital's rule, just, just in case. All right, so I'll do L'Hopital's rule one more time, or you can just write the value of that limit. It's up to you. So if I do L'Hopital again, that'll be three times the limit of 4 over 1. We'll do the derivative top and bottom, and then you get that. So now we have ln of y is equal to 3 times 4. So now we have ln y equals 12. Now, see, the thing, the reason I kept bringing that ln y down because if you don't do that, you're going to forget about it. You're going to think, oh, the answer is 12. No, it isn't. What is the answer? What is y? E to the 12th, right. Okay. Because see what you have 
is you want to just write this in exponential form now, so you get e to the 12th is equal to y. Okay, so that is the value of that limit then would be e to the 12th. So what we would conclude is the limit of this sequence, uh, I'm just going to write this, the conclusion kind of like this, would be equal to e to the 12th. Okay? I wouldn't have known that unless I went through the analysis of that. So that would be the idea. That's kind of an interesting one to put on a graphing calculator. It does level off at e to the 12th. <laughs> okay? Who would have thought that it does? Okay? So see, that's kind of what you get into with L'Hopital's rule a little bit when you're working with sequences and their limits like that. Any questions about that? Okay. So again, when you're dealing with um, any of these forms like 1 to the infinity, you looked at 0 to the infinity, infinity to the infinity, that's when you want to do natural logarithms. Okay. Don't forget to do that when you're doing L'Hopital's rule. And also don't forget that you've got to make sure that you're either... 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity before you can even do L'Hopital's rule, okay? That's important, all right? Okay, let's uh, do another one like that. I want to do a couple of more that are kind of like this, and then we'll, we're going to go through the idea of a geometric sequence here today, too. Okay, so let's see what we got going on on this uh, second one here. Uh, on D. So let's see. Let's just start off by kind of looking at what we have. We have infinity to the 2 over infinity form. Can you tell me what form that is? Uh, infinity to the 0 power. Okay, that's the in indeterminate form. This thing right here goes to 0, right? Don't forget that. That's real crucial as you're doing work with sequences and series. A, a number any number over infinity is going to zero. That's important that you have that down. Okay, so yeah, we have an infinity to the zero power uh, indeterminate form, so we're going to have to work with logarithms. So I'm going to approach this exactly the same way as I did the last problem. So let's start by just picking a variable, say y, and set that equal to n to the 2 over n. Okay, so what do I do next? I want that... Exponent come down. I do logarithms. Good. Okay, so I do ln y equals ln of, whoops, ln of n to the 2 over n, like that. Okay, now you can bring that down. So you have ln y is equal to 2 over n, ln of n, like that then. Okay. So now what we need to do on this one is, what did I miss? Oh, that's ln of n. Okay, that's not just ln. Okay, you've got to have that. Okay, so let's kind of see what we have. I think I'll write this as ln of y is equal to 2 ln n over n like that. And then we'll kind of see where we go with that. Now I'm going to be, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and do the limit of the right-hand side. You can bring that 2 out of the limit, so if you want to write it like this, as 2 times the limit as n goes to infinity of ln n over n, then we're ready to kind of analyze what we have. Okay, So let's think about what's happening on this. Can you guys tell me, if you plug infinity in for n in that place that I highlighted, what kind of form do you have? You have infinity over infinity, right? ln of a number is getting bigger forever and ever. Because in that natural logarithms graph goes like that. And it doesn't hit an asymptote or anything. It just goes on forever. So yeah, this is an infinity over infinity form. So that means that we could do L'Hopital's rule, right? So we need to go ahead and do the derivative of the ln n, and then the derivative of n, and then just keep going from that point then. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, just leave the ln y alone. Uh, then what we're going to have is 2 times, and this is by L'Hopital's rule. Okay, before we do the limit again, let's see, the derivative of ln n, what's that? 1 over n. What's the derivative of n? One. 1. Okay, there we go. Okay, so what we have is ln y equals 2 times the limit as n goes to infinity. Now that's just 1 over n. Okay, so what's the limit of 1 over n? Zero. Okay, good. So what we have 
Yeah, again, a constant over infinity is always going to go to zero. So you're going to have ln y equals 2 times zero. So that's ln y equals zero. Now the answer is not zero. What is it? e to the zero, right? So it'd be one, right? Good. Okay, so see, that's the reason you want to keep that ln coming down. So that uh, is going to be equal to one. Okay, so what we would conclude then is the limit of the sequence n to the 2 over n as n goes to infinity is equal to 1. Okay, you can verify that on a graphing calculator also. You could just put in, in your graphing calculator, you'd have to put in like x to the 2 over x, and it would level off at 1. It would, it would have a horizontal asymptote is what it would have. Okay, that's the idea. Okay, so how does that look to everybody? Okay, so it's L'Hopital's rule is basically most of the work you're doing out here is just like you did in Calc 1. Okay, hopefully you did that in Calc 1. All right, any questions about anything? Okay, let's do, I think I'm going to do one more like this, then we'll begin to get into some of the terminology for the sequences and then the geometric sequence to kind of finish up here. Okay, so let's look at this one. And again, just starting off on this, if you, were, if you replaced n with infinity just to see what kind of form we have, okay, we're going to have an infinity there, and then we have the sign of 0, because see, this thing right here, 6 over infinity, that's going to 0. What's the sign of 0? 0, okay, that's your form. So your form is infinity times 0. That's one of your indeterminate forms. It's not 0. We, they, that's something that we consider that's indeterminate. So that means that what we're going to need to do on this is work with uh, the limit and, and L'Hopital's rule. Now, this one is not going to be one you're going to do an LN on. How come? Because it's not like to a power. You want to look at like, uh, like infinity to the 0, 0 to the 0, one of those things. Okay. So what we have to do on this, remember you have to change this into either this form or into this form. And you're going to see this over and over again, so you'll start getting used to doing this. So let's go ahead and write this as the limit as n goes to infinity of this sequence. And then let's see what you think I should do. I already did this on a previous example. What do you think? Yeah, do something with that n. Put it as oh, put the whole thing as over 1 over n, okay? That way you change it to the form you want, okay? That's real important. And you'll see that over and over again. You just get to where you start seeing this stuff faster. So we're going to have sine of 6 over n, like that, all over 1 over n. <clears throat> okay, is everybody okay with that? Because after all, if you divide by 1 over n, that's the same as multiplying by n, right? Okay. Now let's see if this is a valid L'Hopital problem now. Let's see. So if you do this now, what you have is, I'm just doing the side to show you, you have sine of 6 over infinity all over 1 over infinity. Can you tell me what form that is? It's 0 over 0. Good. Okay, so, because that's sine of 0 is 0, 1 over infinity is 0. So that means that we are allowed to use L'Hopital's rule. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. We need to do the derivative of the top and the bottom. Okay, like that. So I'll just kind of do these derivatives over at the side here. So we're going to do the derivative of the sine, and I'm going to write that as 6 into the negative 1, like that. Okay. All right, so let's see. That's a chain rule, right? So what's that derivative going to be? Cosine. Right, okay. So you got cosine of 6 into the negative 1. Derivative of the inside part by chain rule is negative 6 into the negative 2. So I'm going to write that as negative 6 cosine of 6 over n. And then I'm going to bring that all the way to the uh, bottom like that and write that as n to the second like that. Okay? So that's what that derivative should be. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Chain rule for sine. Okay? And then we also need to do the derivative of 1 over n, okay, which is pretty easy. So that's just power rule. I'm going to write that 1 over n is n to the negative 1. So that's negative 1 into the negative 2. 
So that's negative 1 over n squared like that. Okay. Now, see, I kind of do stuff like that at the side of my paper. That way I'm not keeping the flow of my limit messed up. So I'm going to now write this like this. So the derivative of the sine was this thing. So let's just replace that as negative 6 cosine 6 over n over n squared. Okay, and then this thing is this. So let's plug that in. So we have that. Okay, now there's a couple of basic algebra things happen. Notice the n squareds cancel. Okay, negatives, negatives cancel also. Good. Okay, so what we're going to have is limit as n goes to infinity of 6 cosine 6 over n. And that should be it. Okay, so let's see what we got from there then. Okay. So let's see. Yeah, the 6 over infinity, that's going to go to 0. So what you really have is the limit. Or actually, you have this. I'm done with my limit. So we're just going to have 6 cosine of 0. What's cosine of 0? 1. So 6 times 1 is 6. Okay. So that's the value of the limit. Okay. And again, this one right here is not... It's not easy to do in your head. I, if I go back on that, I wouldn't be able to reason that out in my head. I've got to go through that process to, re, to get that figured out, say. Okay? Sometimes you can do, do these problems in your head. Most of the time you can't. Okay, how's that look? Okay? All right? You're going to find that sequences, to me, are not hard to learn. Series are a lot harder to learn, I think, for students than sequences are. Because mostly sequences, you're, the majority of what you do is Calc 1 stuff anyway. Yeah, that's, that's what will help you with that idea, at least I think. Okay. Now we're going to kind of begin to, to get into something a little different with just with some definitions Okay, on the different types of sequences. I want to talk about this first of all a little bit. So these are the basic types of things that can happen with a sequence if you write out their terms is uh, the idea is we would say it's increasing. That's very obvious what that means. You learned the idea of increasing in Calc 1. That just means that every term in the sequence, the next term is always bigger than the previous term. That's what this statement right here is saying. A, a sub n plus 1 is saying the next term in the sequence is always bigger than the previous term. Okay. So this one is going to be a increasing sequence. Okay, now we got another one that says non-decreasing. Okay, the, what this one is saying is the next term is always greater than or equal to the previous term. Does that make sense that this sequence is following that definition? Okay, like 1 is equal to 1. That's okay. 2 is equal to 2. Now that thing is increasing in nature, but the fact that that subsequent terms are equal to each other means it would not be increasing. It's called non-decreasing. Does that make sense to everybody, the difference between the two? Okay. Basically, all it's talking about is the difference between a greater than or equal to symbol and a greater than symbol. That's what it's stating. Okay. Then it works this way. Decreasing is going to say the next term is always strictly less than the previous term. So like 1 is less than 2, 0 is less than 1, and so forth. So that's decreasing. Non-increasing just means the next term is always less than or equal to the previous one. Okay, so that would be less than 0, but then negative 1 is equal to that, so that's non-increasing. Okay, and you're going to see some sequences sometimes. You can have a sequence that might just be 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 forever, like that. Okay, so these are the possibilities if you've got increasing, non-decreasing, decreasing, and non-increasing. Okay, like that. Okay, so if you had one, it's, it's real simple. If you had one, say, like this. Let's say you had a half, a half, a fourth, a fourth, an eighth, and an eighth. What is that? What kind of sequence do you think that is? Yeah, okay, that one's getting smaller. Okay, but since you have some terms that are equal next to each other, that's going to be the same thing as, and those numbers are getting smaller on that, so that's going to be this one, isn't it? Non-increasing, right? Okay, everybody solid with that? 
Oh, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. yeah, okay. I think I heard a couple people say non-decreasing. Those are getting smaller. Where do you think this sequence I just made up is going to for a limit? Probably zero. Looks like it's getting closer to zero because the numerator is one, the denominator is doubling, so that's going to go to zero. Okay? All right, the other thing we have is what we call a monotonic sequence, and that just means it's either non-increasing or non-decreasing. So just think of it this way as the sequence moves in one direction. Okay, you can have some things equal to each other. So it's got to fall it's either got to be this or it's got to be this. Okay, one of the two. It can't be uh, now it can also be increasing and it can also be decreasing as well. So the idea is it's got to just move in one direction. Okay? It can't oscillate. You couldn't have something like, like this. 1, negative 1, 2, negative 2, 3, negative 3. That's not monotonic because it's oscillating. It's going from positives to negatives. Okay, So it's got to be any of these things right here is what makes it monotonic. Any of those. Okay? It can be increasing, decreasing, or non-decreasing and non-increasing like that. Okay, And then the other thing we say is bounded... A sequence sometimes can be bounded, sometimes it's unbounded. That would be if there's a number such that, and this right here just means the absolute value of every term in the sequence. This is just any term. Any term in the sequence is always going to be less than or equal to that number. Okay, like that. So an example would be like, uh, well, if you take this example right here, that sequence right there, that's bounded. Okay, the biggest number that this sequence is ever going to hit is one half, right? So it's bounded by one half. All right, so that's bounded. Whereas this one is unbounded, isn't it? Okay, because if you look at this one, it's going to go four negative four, five negative four. What's it going to do? It's going to get bigger and smaller at the same time, but it's going to oscillate from sides. Does that make sense? So that one's unbounded. Okay, got a question? What do you, so what would you call um, that? A, a, what would you call that sequence? Do you have a specific name for it, or it doesn't really matter? It's just an oscillating sequence. Uh, oscillating, and it's unbounded. Okay. 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 Yeah, oscillating okay. just means the signs alternate yeah. from positive to negative, like that. Okay, and that's the idea. Okay, now this is also, uh, this says, because an increasing sequence is also non-decreasing, it's also monotonic. So when you think of monotonic, just think of it can be any of these uh, right here. Increasing, non-decreasing, decreasing, and non-increasing like that. So that's just all terminology and vocabulary that you want to learn. Okay? All right, so let's look at a few of these and classify these. Then we'll go into the geometric sequence a little bit here. Okay, so let's see kind of what we have on each one of these things. Now, monotonic, just think of it this way. It just goes in one direction. That's the way I think of it. It kind of gets all the stuff going. It's either going to always get, be getting bigger or always going to get smaller, or it may be constant. It could be like 1, 1, 1, or it could be 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, something like that. So how about A? Uh, hey, do you think that's monotonic? Where's that sequence going to? What does it look like it's going to? Yeah, probably 1 is where that's going to. These, these ratios are getting closer to the same number, aren't they? Okay, so that one's monotonic. Okay. The idea with this one is this is getting bigger. So you're starting with one half, and then you're getting bigger. Every fraction is getting a little bigger. It's just getting closer and closer to one. So that's monotonic. Okay, is it bounded or unbounded? Bounded. What is, what is it bounded by? What number? One. Okay, that's a good boundary for it. So it is bounded. Remember, uh, that just means that every term in the sequence is less than some number. So a half is less than one, three-fourths is less than one, and so forth. Okay, that's what that means. Okay? All right. Now the next one, let's see. Is this one monotonic? Is it going in one direction? No. Okay, it's oscillating, right? Okay, because that one's going plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, kind of bouncing back and forth between uh, like that. So that one is uh, not monotonic. We usually just say that that one's oscillating. So that one is oscillating sequence. Okay, now let's think about whether it's uh, bounded or not. Okay, well, 
where does it look like this sequence going? I mean, the numerator is always a 1 or a negative 1. The denominator is getting bigger. Where is it going? Zero. Zero. Okay. But that's not really uh, part of the bound boundary. What you're looking for is the definition of bounded is every term in the sequence has to be less than something. So actually, the biggest term in this sequence is 1. So it's bounded by 1. Okay, so basically every term in this sequence, and what we say is we say the absolute value of every term in that sequence is going to be less than or equal to 1. Okay, that's why it's bounded. Okay, you don't have to give me the number it's bounded by, but you need to see that. Okay. Okay, how about the next one? Is it monotonic or not monotonic? No. Okay, how come? Because it, it oscillates. There you go. Okay, so that one's not monotonic. <clears throat> and uh, it would oscillate. How about bounded? What do you think on this one? Yes or no? No, that one's not bounded. Okay, it just gets bigger forever, so it's unbounded. Okay, how about the next one? Is it monotonic? Yeah. Yep, it is. Okay, and the reason is, is remember we said it could follow any of these things right here, any of these. Okay, so if you look at this one, it's actually non-decreasing and non-increasing at the same time, right? Okay, because it follows that definition. This just says the next term is always greater than or equal to the previous. So it is non-decreasing. If it's just a string of the same number over and over again, it's non-decreasing. Because it doesn't decrease, okay? It just stays the same. And it's also non-increasing. So that one is monotonic. Is it bounded? Obviously. <laughs> okay. Bounded by one, exactly. Okay. So yeah, that one's monotonic and it's bounded. And every term in the sequence is less than or equal to one. It's equal to one. Okay? That's why. So just follow the definition. If you're unsure about these things, just go back to the definition. That's what you always do in math. Okay, if you don't know something, go to the definition. Yeah. It, so the correct way is saying bounded by even if the whole entire um, even if the whole entire sequence is just going to equal one, you would still just say bounded by. It, yeah, you terms are less than. Yeah, it it's it's all it's you got to find a number that every term in the sequence is less than or equal. Yeah, but you can't just say that that is one. The sequence it's bound. Is. Well, the, the, I guess the the directions of the problem say classify. Okay, okay. I just didn't want to. Yeah. Do, I just didn't know if it was. Correct. In fact, all you have to say is bounded or unbounded. Okay. Okay. But you always want to kind of think about what is that number it's bounded by. Yeah, as you're doing that. Okay. All right. You guys got any questions about that that stuff? Yeah, that's that's just basically your terminology that you want to be careful comfortable with. Okay. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about geometric sequences next and we actually will come back to this quite a bit when we're talking with uh, series a little bit here so uh, basically a geometric sequence is a certain type of sequence it has the property that each term is obtained by multiplying the previous term by a fixed constant so let me show you how you make a geometric sequence okay you can start anywhere you want to I'm gonna start with like one and what I'm going to do is just keep multiplying by 2. 1 times 2 is 2. 2 times 2 is 4. 4 times 2 is 8. Okay, that's a geometric sequence. Okay, that's one example. Here's another example. I'm going to multiply everything by a half. 1 times a half is a half. Half times a half is a fourth. Uh, fourth times a half is an eighth and so forth. That's what geometric sequences look like. Okay, you get the next term by multiplying by the same number over and over again. And that number is called the ratio. We use R. So in this case, R would be 2. In that, that case, R would be a half. Does that make sense to everybody? That's what geometric sequences look like. And, and not to be confused with something like this. Like if you had 1, 3, 5, 7, that is adding 2 every time. That's not geometric. It's multiplying by the same thing. So that's what a geometric sequence is. It's always going to have this structure. It's going to be some number to a power, the ratio to a power, or you can have a constant in front. That A can be any constant. It can be anything except zero. If it was A was zero, then it would be zero. Um, so that's what the general structure looks like. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about 
the convergence or divergence of a geometric sequence. And it turns out that it's just, it's, it's, it's what R is. The value of R will tell you whether this uh, converges or diverges. So this one, I, some of these things here I just did on the graphing calculator. I did show you guys how to put sequences in your calculator. So if you put this one in your calculator, it would kind of go something like, uh, do something like this. And I'll just do a, a real fast review on this. I, cause I did, I had the directions how to do this. But when you do a sequence in your calculator, anytime you want to graph a sequence, you've got to go mode, and then you've got to go down to the button that says sequence, like that. So you'll have the ability to put this in. The other thing you can do is just put in, just have it in function mode and just put 1.2 to the X in, and it'll still give you the same thing, but it won't have the discrete dots in it. So you put that in like that, and then when you press Y equals, then it's going to go basically like this. You just put in u sub n is 1.2 raised to the n power. So the variable is now going to be n like that. And then you can set your window up on this. I'll, you can go like 0 to 10. But the plot step is like n is going by 1. And that's the way it always goes on a sequence is n is going up by 1. And then you can do the min and max however you want to. So, so for y, I'm going to do like something like 0 to 10, <laughs> like that. And uh, let's see if I graph that now. You'll have basically what I have on your handout, something like that. Okay, so does that thing look like it converges or diverges? Looks like it diverges. It looks like it just gets bigger and bigger forever. Okay, that one is going to be a uh, increasing sequence. Okay, every term is increasing like that. So that would certainly be uh, an increasing one. Now we're just doing this now kind of by looking at the graph. So that's going to diverge okay, on, on that particular one then. Okay, And this one is monotonic. Okay, It is moving in one direction. Okay, It's unbounded. And it does diverge like that. Okay, so that's pretty simple. All right. Uh, the next one, let's see. Now, I've, if you put this one in your graphing calculator in the sequence mode, you would get something like this, okay? Now, does that look like it's diverging or converging? What do you think? That's diverging. What's happening is, you know, it's getting bigger and it's getting smaller at the same time, but it's oscillating, isn't it? So this one is oscillating, so it's not a monotonic sequence, so it's oscillating, and let me ask you a question, see if you guys have caught on to this yet. Well, what makes it oscillate? Because it's a negative inside of the value. There you go. It's got a negative inside of a parenthesis. So what's going to happen is if n is even, what's going to happen? What kind of number do you get? Positive. You get a positive. If it's odd, what do you get? You get a negative. That's what cause. See, you're going to learn to recognize this. Anytime you have a negative, and, and it doesn't just have to be an n. It could be n plus 1, n plus 2, 2n, whatever. Okay, uh, well, not 2n. That would kind of mess things up a little bit because it would always be even. But that's what really makes that thing oscillate. Okay, like that. So this one's also going to diverge and it's going to be <laughs> unbounded as well. Okay, there's no number that, uh, that every term in the sequence is always going to be less than. Okay, so that's how that goes. Okay, now let's go to the next page. And I'm going to look at maybe one more of these and kind of look at this one. Now, I did this one on the graphing calculator. So does that look like it converges or diverges? It looks like it's going to what value? As n goes to infinity, where's the sequence look like it's going to? Zero, right. Okay, this one does converge. Okay, now we're going to look at, beginning to look at this a little bit uh, more analytically. So that one is going to converging to zero if you put that in then, okay? So we would say the limit as n goes to infinity would go to zero like that. Now one of the things I want to do a little bit with this one, uh, before I do anything with the definition of the convergence of a geometric sequence, is look at this a little bit. Let's just rewrite this as 2 to the n times 2 to the first, like that, and then let's write this as 
1 over 3 to the n like that. Okay, I'm just splitting up the 2 to the n plus 1 into 2 to the n times 2 to the first, because you can add exponents when you multiply <coughs> numbers with the same base. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this together. Uh, I'm going to write this as 2 to the n over 3 to the n, and then I'm going to put that leftover 2 just in front here to kind of show you my analysis of why this is a geometric sequence. Okay, That whole thing right there, couldn't you put that whole thing to the n power, like 2 thirds to the n? Wouldn't that be the same? Okay, That would just be 2 times 2 thirds to the n. So one of the things we said is a geometric sequence has the form a times r to the n. Okay, so this thing right here would be the value of r, and that's two thirds. Okay, that is a geometric sequence. Just by playing with the algebra a little bit, I, I'm able to put it in that basic form like that. And it's going to turn out the fact that since this thing right here is between 1 and z negative 1, uh, that's going to be why this thing converges. Okay, and I'll show you a little bit more of why that is here in just a minute. So that really is going to tell you why that converges. It, well, like I said, whatever the value of R is, is ultimately going to tell you whether this thing converges or diverges in a geometric sequence only. So here's the idea. So this diagram is kind of showing you that if R is greater than 1, you're going to diverge. Now let me show you this. That's real easy to understand, too. Okay? Remember, a geometric sequence has the form a r to the n, or you could just say r to the n like this. Okay, let's pick a number that's bigger than 1. Let's say like 2, 2 to the n. Tell me what would happen. If you wrote out the terms in that sequence, what would happen? You would end up having 2 to the first, 2 to the second, 2 to the third, and so forth. Does that look like it would diverge or converge? very clearly diverges. It just gets bigger forever, right? So when that radius, when that number right there is bigger than 1, those values are going to get bigger without limit. Does that make sense? Even if it was 1.1 to the n, the terms get bigger, okay? Now let's go out here and see what happens here. Let's try like something like negative 2. If you had negative 2 to the n, and wrote out the terms of that sequence, you'd have like negative 2 to the first, negative 2 to the second, negative 2 to the third, and so forth like that. That would be negative 2, 4, negative 8, so it would oscillate, but would it ever uh, come down to a point, or would it just get bigger forever and smaller forever? See, that's the idea. But once you have your convergence between negative 1 and 1, if r is between 1 and 1, then it converges. So let me show you what that is. Let's pick a number like for r that's between negative 1 and 1. Let's keep it simple. Let's say like you have a half. So if you had 1 half to the n and wrote out the terms, how would that go? That would go 1 half to the first, 1 half to the second, 1 half to the third, and so forth. Now tell me, does that look like it converges to you? Yeah. Or is it going? You have 1 half, 1 fourth, 1 eighth, 1 sixteenth, 1 over 32. Where's it going? Zero. Zero. See what I mean? So basically, any time that radius is between negative 1 and 1, that's going to cause that thing to go down to some value like that. So that's what happens is your convergence happens here. And you're also equal to 1. The reason if r is equal to 1, so if r was equal to 1, then you would just have 1 to the n. Well, what is that? that? That would be 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 forever, so it would converge to 1. Okay, that's the idea. All right? If you had negative 1, the reason that r can't be negative 1 is because of this. Well, then if you had negative 1 to the n, why would that not converge? Because it would oscillate, exactly. It would go negative 1, 1, negative 1, 1, 1, and just forever and ever. It would be either a 1 or negative 1, so it doesn't converge to some value. So you need to make sure that you understand the why part of this. R, it basically tells you the convergence on geometric sequence. Okay, So it would kind of go like this. If you had something like 1 fourth to the n, that converges. How come? 
That's a fractional value between negative 1 and 1, right? Okay. How about if you had this? 10 to the n. Converge or diverge? How come? Because r is bigger than 1. See, that's the idea. All right? So that's what you, that's what you want to make sense of. Now, you can still have an oscillating sequence that can converge. That's what I'm going to show you on this next example. Okay, so that's basically how you tell if a geometric sequence converges or diverges. You look at R. Okay, that's it. That's what it's all about. Okay, let me talk a little bit about the squeezing theorem, which you would have learned in uh, Calc 1 a little bit, and we've done a little bit with in this class too. It basically says you have three sequences, A sub n, B sub n, and C sub n. And the idea would be that if you had one sequence and it's always less than or equal to every member of the other sequence, and it's always greater than or equal to the, uh, the, a, the sequence a sub n, then you could make this conclusion. So basically the idea would be, like this is c sub n. That's the blue dots I got right here. Here's a sub n. Those are the red dots right there. Now this sequence that's in the middle, since it's always sandwiched in between those two values, it's going to be, if you can figure out that, that this one, so if you can figure out that the limit of C sub n is going to some value, and if you can figure out that the limit of uh, A sub n is going to the same value, then what do you conclude about the one in the middle? It goes to the same value. That's the squeezing theorem, and it works for sequences the same way because a sequence can be modeled by functions anyway. So the squeezing theorem that you learn in Calc 1 is based on functions, but we can base it on sequences as well. So that's the idea. Okay, Okay. let's work a little bit with the squeezing theorem and, um, and kind of look at this a little bit. If you look at these things graphically, you can tell pretty clearly what it is. But I'm going to show you on this one how we would do the, the squeezing theorem to find the limit. So we're going to do actually the limit. Ultimately, we're going to find the limit of the sequence cosine n over n squared plus 1, like that. Now, I went ahead and put it on my graphing calculator. You can tell it converges, right? Where does it look like it's going? Zero. Okay, probably. That's, that's what it looks like. So what I'm going to do is we're going to do the squeezing theorem. Now, when you do the squeezing theorem, Here's the key, and I'm only kind of limiting this to certain things. Uh, we need to find two functions that we know that this is bounded in the middle of. Okay. Now, here's the way I look at this is like this. Let's think about a cosine. Cosine graph. What's the highest value a cosine ever hits? One. one. What's the lowest value? One. Okay, so we can do this. We could put a 1 there, and we could keep the n squared plus 1. That's a guarantee. If we keep that denominator the same, we know that numerator is bounded by 1, right? Okay, what am I going to put on the left side, you think? Same thing. Negative 1, okay? That's bounded. The cosine of n is always greater than or equal to negative 1. Keep the denominator the same like that. So when you're doing the squeezing theorem, you've got to figure out two functions that it's squeezed in the middle of. Sometimes that's easy. Sometimes it's extremely difficult. We use trig functions a lot in this class. We kind of keep it to a certain level. Okay, now here's what we do. So now by the squeezing theorem, we need to do two things. We need to do the limit of the, function, the sequence that we came up with there. We need to do that limit. Okay, and then we also need to do the limit of the other sequence, which is 1 over n squared plus 1. And what we're going to do is, if they go to the same number, then we can conclude that the sequence b sub n would go to the same number. Okay, so can you tell me where, what the limit of negative 1 over n squared plus 1 is? Zero, right. Okay, what is that? It's negative 1 over infinity. That's going to zero. How about this one? Same thing, 1 over infinity, that's going to zero. So what you can conclude now is you say, therefore the limit as n goes to infinity of the cosine of n over n squared plus 1 is equal to 0 by the squeezing theorem, st, squeezing theorem, okay?
That's it. That's the main. That's the idea of, of how you establish that. The theory, squeezing theorem, like if you study mathematics at a higher level and stuff, you actually use it a lot in proofs and stuff like that. <clears throat> okay. So let's do this next one. The next one is basically the same idea. Okay, it's not much different. So I think every example I'm going to do is going to have a trig function in it, and it just kind of it makes the um, finding those sequences pretty easy to do. Okay. All right. So how do you think I should do this one? Same idea, isn't it? Okay, the sign has a high value of 1 and a low value of negative 1. So what do I want to put over here on the right side? 1 over 2 at the end. Don't change the denominator. You want that to stay the same. Okay, all right. How about on the left, what am I going to put? There you go, like that. Okay, all right. So then what we do is we have to do two things. We have to do the limit of this sequence, okay, and then we also got to do the limit of the sequence on the right, okay, so that is 1 over 2 to the n, n goes to infinity. So what are the values of those two limits? Zero, right. This is See, this is really negative 1 over 2 to the infinity. So it goes to zero. This is the same idea. That's 1 over infinity. That goes to zero, okay? Yes? It's not like, that's not like a trick. It just happens to be that the problems that we're going through, we're only dealing with the numerator. Yeah, I, you okay. generally want to okay. keep the, if you have a fraction, I get, the key thing is I'm giving you a sequence that's a fraction. Yeah, okay. So a, a good thought process on a fraction is keep the denominator the same and see if you can figure out anything going on in the numerator, okay? It's different for every situation. But again, some of these things can get really complicated. So what we'd have on this then is we would then conclude that the limit of the sign in to the n is also zero by the squeezing theorem. Should that be the one that goes to infinity? Yes, not, uh, yeah. I only put half of an infinity there. Okay, oop. The other half got ate up. Okay. So everybody understand that okay? Those two examples are pretty much the same thing. The, the last one that I wanted to do with the squeezing theorem uh, has to do with a tangent, so it's a little different in the way that you want to do this. And let's see kind of what I got going on on here. Okay, now I went ahead and put a graph on here because if you're dealing with a, an inverse tangent, you want to think about the graph and how that's bounded, because an, uh, an arc tangent's bounded. So we're going to start this off the same way. We have 2 times the inverse tangent of n over n to the third plus 4. So when we're applying the squeezing theorem, we need to figure out two sequences. Okay, now again, since, since it's a fraction, the idea would be let's not do anything with that denominator. Let's keep that the same. Okay, well, it's really the same idea as the sine and cosine, but if you look at the graph, what is the biggest value that an arc tangent's graph ever hits? Pi over 2. What's the smallest value? Okay, so you have to know that graph to know that. So if you're dealing with something like a function, think of the graphs. That'll help you a little bit. So we're going to put like a pi over 2 there, and then we're going to put a negative pi over 2 like that, okay? So that would be the way that we get that set up. So now what we need to do is we just got to do these limits. So we need to do the limit as n goes to infinity of negative pi over 2. We're going to do that limit. Then we're going to do the limit as n goes to infinity of pi over 2 over n cubed plus 4. Now, you can just do this in your head, okay? <laughs> what do those limits go to? Zero. Zero. Did you have a question? Um, it might not matter in this particular case, but is that constant for two come into play anywhere with those? Or what's the reason? Uh, yeah, it, you know, it actually wouldn't matter, but you're right. What I need to do on this is, um, oh, no, uh, the thing on this is, no, 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 you are right. I didn't notice that 2 right there. So that really what we need to do is have a, a 2 there and a 2 there. 
Okay, like that. Yeah, it'll, it'll still go to the same place, but yeah, I'm getting a little sloppy on that. So, yeah, that's important. Okay. All right. So what we really have now is this. Okay, that thing crosses out, so the twos are going to cross out, right? So you're going to end up with a with a negative pi and a pi right there, but it's still zero, isn't it? Okay. Because see, what this is is this is a constant. Pi is a constant. N cubed plus 4 is going to infinity, so that thing is going to 0. So that means that we would conclude, therefore, that's what my three dots are saying, we would say, therefore, the limit as N goes to infinity of 2 inverse tangent of N over N to the third plus 4 is also going to go to 0, like that. Okay. Now, it always went to 0. That's just coincidence. Okay. But uh, as far as what I'm going to look at, in this section with squeezing theorem, I have to kind of give you things that that you can reason out usually graphically, because sometimes these things can get really complicated finding a function. But trig functions aren't too bad. Okay, uh, so this is a a sequence just kind of attached to a me, uh, some uh, a medical problem with dosages, which is kind of interesting. Um, so basically. Medications usually have what's called a half-life. A lot of you have probably been in chemistry by now and learned about half-lives and stuff like that. So um, medications have that, and that's an important part of what a physician is doing when they're regulating medicine, is knowing what those half-lives are. Some medicines take a long time to get out of your bloodstream. Some get out pretty quickly. Uh, so basically what this one's saying is that you're prescribed a 100 milligram dose of some antibiotic you take this every 12 hours, okay, and then we also know the half-life is 12 hours. So every 12 hours, half of the drug in your, your blood is eliminated, but at the same time, you're still every 12 hours taking medicine, right? So what the doctor would hope that doesn't happen is that you just keep, the drug just get uh, diverges, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, you wouldn't want this to just become infinite, because you might uh, not be so good, right? <laughs> okay, you might end up in the emergency room or something. So we're going to look at this kind of like a sequence, and we're going to see hopefully this levels off. And that's the, that's the way a lot of medications work, is the doctor wants to get it to level off to a certain value. Okay, I don't think they do sequences in, in their office. I suspect they have a computer program and that kind of guides them through a lot of this stuff. Okay. I'll ask my physician friend and see what she says. I'll ask her if she does sequences in her office, and she's probably going to laugh at me. So here's what we're going to do on this. We're going to do, um, I'm going to write on here, we're going to use D just for a drug dosage on this. So D1 would be like the first element of this sequence, which would be 100 milligrams. Okay, that's going to end up being your original dosage like this. Now, what we're doing is the sequence, you're figuring in the half-life at the same time. So if you look at d sub n plus 1, we're going to write like um, uh, an explicit formula on this, or a recurrence relation, not an explicit formula. So this goes like this. What you're going to do on this sequence is you're going to, when, when the next 12 hours comes, what's going to happen? You're going to take another round of medicine, right? But then what's going to happen to the 100 that you already did? It's going to go down to 50 now, right? Okay. So let's just kind of write out a couple of terms in the sequence. D1 is going to be 100. D2 is actually going to be 100 plus half of 100. So that's going to be like 150 and so forth like that. Let's do one more. D3 is actually going to be 100 plus, or no, let's do it this way, 150. Okay, like that. We're going to do 150 like that. That's already in your bloodstream, but then you're going to, no, hold on, that's not right. You're going to take another round of medicine, sorry. You're going to take another pill. Now it's going to be half of 150. So what's that? 75? That'd be 175. Okay, so by looking at this, does it kind of look like it's going to level off and converge at some value? Okay, it's not going to go out of control because you always have that half-life that you're doing. So what you're always doing in this recurrence relation is you're always doing 100 plus a half of what was already in your bloodstream. So we're going to do half 
of d sub n, okay, like that. That would be the recurrence relation that you would write that for like that then. So that would be how you would write the recurrence relation as this. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Okay, all right. So what we're going to do now, now you could actually put this in, like if you graphed these points out and did this, what I kind of found, and I did this like with a calculator, is this thing ends up leveling off at 200. By looking at the graph, you can tell it's going to converge. But what I want to do on this one is do this more analytically. So if you do that recurrence relationship and graph those points, you can tell the convergence of that. And that would be what the physician is wanting. So what we're going to do is we're going to find this more directly when we do this. So let's write down what we need. We have d sub n plus 1. I'm going to write this just as 0 0.5 d sub n. That's a half of what's already in your system plus the 100 milligram pill that you're going to take. Okay. And then what we're going to do is we're going to let, um, let's see, the limit... Uh, let's see, I was going to do this like, yeah, let's do this. This is what I wanted to do. I wanted to do the limit of d sub n plus 1 as n goes to infinity, and let's just say that's equal to L. We don't know what it's going to go to, so let's just set that equal to, uh, to some term like that. Okay, so what we're going to do next is we're going to do the limit of both sides of this equation. So we're going to go ahead and do the limit as n goes to infinity of d sub n plus 1, like that. And then we're going to do the limit of this side. And then that will give us an equation that I think we'll be able to solve and find out. Oops, this is going to be 0.5 d sub n plus 100, like that. Okay, so we're going to work with that a little bit. Okay, so the idea with this is going to be, um, I'm going to just write this down kind of like this. This thing right here is going to become L, right there. That's just the variable. We don't know what that is, so I'm just substituting in a variable. Then I'm going to do this limit right here. Now, I'm going to do a limit theorem to do this, just to remind you that you can do that. So I'm going to bring that 0.5 out and write that as the limit as n goes to infinity of d sub n plus, and then we're going to do the limit as n goes to infinity of 100 like that then, okay? And then the idea is going to, to be this then, all right? So first of all, this right here, if you look at the limit as n goes to infinity of d sub n, okay? Now what this is saying is this, when, when you're way, way out, okay? I'm talking way out in the sequence. Aren't these two things right here going to be the same? Okay, all that says, like if that was the one millionth dose of the medicine, okay, then the one million and one dose of the medicine is going to be roughly the same. Do you agree? So that thing right there is also going to be L. So you're going to have an equation that you can solve for L now. That's the idea. So what I'd have is this becomes 0.5. This thing right here gets replaced with L also, because we're talking about the limit of the sequence as n goes to infinity. And then that's going to be the limit of 100, of course, is 100. So that's an equation you can solve. Let's see if we don't get 200 out of that then. Okay. So what I'm going to do is subtract. That's 1L minus 0.5L equals 100. So that's 0.5L equals 100. Then if I divide by 0.5, I'm going to get L equals 200. That's it. That's how you would do that. Okay? So that's the idea. You're kind of indirectly doing that sequence. Once you set up that uh, recurrence relation, then you can do the limit of both sides of that equation. Okay? Now, I'm just using L as a variable. The key thing that you want to understand on this problem is this stuff right there. They are the same roughly as N goes to infinity. Agreed? Okay, so that's how you would figure that out. So that would be leveling off at that particular thing like that. So a physician does have to figure out, I'm sure they do that with charts and things that are figured out, computer programs, that if somebody's on a drug for a certain amount of time and they want it to level off to something, they definitely have to figure out the half-life and know that 
and be able to understand how the dosage is going to work. Okay, I know physicians do that. My dad was a physician. He was a psychiatrist. And what he had to do was, um, like a lot of stuff like antidepressants and stuff like that, they level off at a certain value, and people take those things, you know, for a certain value. He was also, uh, before he became a psychiatrist, he was a, back in those days, uh, uh, doctors made house calls back in the 50s and 60s like that. And he was, we thought for a long time that he may have been the person who delivered Brad Pitt. Okay. Because it, Brad Pitt was born in Shawnee, Oklahoma, in the same hospital where I was born. But we figured out it wasn't him. It was my dad's best friend, a colleague of him. So it's still kind of cool. But we thought for a long time that my father delivered Brad Pitt. And since, it, since my name's Brad also, maybe they got us mixed up at delivery. I don't know. <laughs> I was supposed to be the handsome actor. <laughs> okay. Let's do one more thing here. Um, so to finish this up, what I want to look at a little bit is we're not going to really do formal proofs. One thing that you probably did in Calc 1 a little bit is some proofs of epsilon delta, maybe just lightly. You don't really do much of that unless you're a math major and you're in real analysis and that kind of a thing, but just kind of get your feet wet. The idea behind a limit of a sequence, I'm just going to do this part A on this. I'm not going to do the proof. I'm going to kind of show you what the epsilon means on this. So the idea is if you have a sequence, and you're kind of looking at this like this. If you're looking at the limit, you, do, you want to write this part down. Uh, the limit as n goes to infinity of some sequence a sub n. What's up? This is not in your handout? Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, let me go ahead and go through just this one thing. Okay. You don't have to write it down. Just pay attention to it. I don't. Somewhere we can find it. No, I think this was supposed to be there. I really do. And maybe it got chopped off when I downloaded it or something. Okay. Well, anyway, let me just do this one part here. Write it down if you want to. This is not something I'm going to emphasize a lot, though. So the idea is going to be is if you do the distance between an, an, an element of the sequence, a sub n is any element of the sequence, and the value that it's converging to as n goes to infinity, that's going to be less than some value of epsilon. And epsilon is a number greater than zero, and you can make it as close to zero as you want to. And the idea what I'm going to show you is finding a value of n in the sequence on this one example. If epsilon was 0.1, I'm going to basically tell you how far out in the sequence you would have to go in order for the distance between the sequence and the value of the limit to be about 0.01, okay? Just to kind of give you a rough idea. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take uh, in this part A, we have the limit as n goes to infinity of n over n minus 1 equals 1. So we're, we're not going to do a proof. I'm just going to take that epsilon and show you how, how we're going to work with this. So we want to start by doing this. You always take the sequence like this, and you subtract the value of that limit like that, and that's going to be less than epsilon. Okay. Now, what will happen on this, really roughly what this definition is saying, is the further and further you go out on the sequence, if this limit exists and that value is 1, which it is in this particular case, then we'll always have a positive number epsilon. It's just going to get smaller and smaller, no matter how far out we go in the sequence. Okay. So I'm going to replace that epsilon with 0.01, and we're going to solve an equation. This is a pretty easy algebra problem, actually. So, so we're going to just solve this equation uh, for n. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace this with a capital N because that's representing a particular place in the sequence. We're going to figure out how far out you go in this sequence to gain that kind of accuracy with epsilon. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a common denominator on this. And, uh, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. That's n minus 1 over n minus 1 like that. 
So we're going to put that together and solve that equation for n. Okay, and that'll tell us how far we go out in the sequence. This is the main thing I want you guys to know how to do from, from this section on this. So I'm going to do this, that algebra like that. You could do that in your head if you wanted to. And then if you do this, see if you're doing n minus n plus 1 after you change those signs, that's just going to give you 1 over n minus 1 less than the epsilon, which I gave you as 0.01 like that. Okay? So, now, I can take the absolute value off. The reason I can do that is because the absolute value of 1 is 1. Okay? What kind of number is n in a sequence? It's a whole number. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, right? So you don't need the absolute value in that sequence. You just take it off because we know that's positive. We know that for a fact. So now what I can do is I can solve this equation, and that will tell you how far you, out you go in the sequence to gain that degree of accuracy. So I could cross-multiply this, so I would have 0 0.01 times n minus 1 is less than 1. You can do that on an inequality if you're multiplying. Both of those numbers are positive, and that's important on that. You're, that, that way you're not changing the sign. So you'd have 0.01n minus 0.01 is less than 1. Then I can add uh, 0.01 to both sides like this. So that's going to give 0.01n is less than 1.01. .01. Then you can divide that, and then that'll give you the value, whatever that is. Okay, I don't know what that is. Is that 100? And no, no, it's bigger than that. So I'm just going to type 1.01 .01 and divide that by 0.01. And then that'll tell you how far out you go in the sequence to gain that degree of accuracy. So that just means if as long as n is less than 101, then epsilon is going to have to be uh, equal. Then epsilon, you're going to be within that degree of accuracy. So the idea is if epsilon, if you put more and more and more and more zeros in there, well, what would happen? It just means you would go out further and further in the sequence to gain that degree of accuracy. That's a rough idea of what the, what the technical definition of a limit of a sequence is. But I'm not going to do a whole lot with that. That's not probably as important in this level of a class as it is in uh, analysis and those higher areas of mathematics. But it's good to get your feet wet with that a little bit.